takeoff and recovery around the world led to declining prices and declining profits. Uh, the US itself uh, drove this crisis by spending too much on the Vietnam War uh, and uh, extracting uh, money from the rest of the world via its command as the of the dollar as the world reserve currency. Uh, and eventually the US economy couldn't sustain this. And next slide. It comes off uh, the dollar, which from 1940, 1944 through to 1971, the dollar had been linked to gold. And that one troy ounce of gold was worth, uh, was, it, uh, was it, I'm forgetting this now, I think it's $32. Uh, this particular link uh, was broken in 1971. Uh, and what it allowed was the massive expansion of the US money supply. Of course, not at their expense, but at the whole world's expense. Because the dollar is the global reserve currency, is the currency in which oil is marketed, in which oil money is saved in London, uh, in which uh, uh, a whole variety of business systems is, is conducted. Uh, the, the money supply, which in 30 years, 45 to 71, had increased in America to 5%, over the, last, uh, over the next 30 years, 71 to 2001, uh, multiplied times 20. So, whoosh, capital. Uh, the, the West responded to an industrial crisis by going for financialization, for, by generating a, 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 a flood of capital uh, to, and, and a set of increasingly securitized and financialized uh, uh, private economic and social uh, um, uh, uh, entities um, to, to sustain this, this financialization. So we see the emergence of a new financial model uh, together with the retreat of the state uh, from economic intervention uh, in industry with a, a massive growth in capital markets and in debt. We have an attack on labor's power to negotiate wages by anti-union legislation, which is passed across the world, uh, particularly in Britain and the United States. Uh, and this is, goes side by side with privatization, the transfer of wealth of public assets to the private, what, private realm. The only way this thing survives in the context of the squeeze and real wages is by the decision taken in the United States and Britain to increase the private indebtedness of their citizens. And the banks are given the go-ahead from the 1980s onwards to remove the restraints on the private capacity of citizens to borrow. And what we've had in the United States and Britain is a privatization of Keynesianism, where private debt, where instead of the state intervening to solve slumps in the business cycle, private individuals have been persuaded to borrow money. And as they've been allowed to borrow money, their assets, which is to say the houses, which some people own, have shot up in value. So they're able to borrow more money. And they feel safe about this because their houses are now worth this much, so they're told. And this cycle has driven a situation where we now have trillions of pounds of private debt. Uh, next slide, please. Does neoliberalism <coughs> work? Well, it works in terms of making elites richer, you see, uh, in terms of the transfer of wealth from the poor and the middle uh, to the rich. Uh, no, in terms of real economic growth and the experience of ordinary people. Uh, what we've seen with the collapse of wages, the privatization of debt, the financialization of society has been the oversaving of the super rich, the accumulation of too much wealth, inefficient amount of wealth, uh, and underinvestment in the real economy. And what we can see if we look, and there's a wonderful article you can look for on the web called The Emperor Has No Growth. And The Emperor Has No Growth, uh, done by a very good group of, of policy economists in Washington, uh, shows that in 1960-80, output per person globally grew by 83%. In the period of the neoliberal ascendancy from 80 to 2000, output per person grew by only 33%. And that figure looks better than it should because, in fact, it is uh, dopé, as the French would say, uh, by uh, slipping in the statistics from China and Southeast Asia where all the neoliberal rules have been broken, where the state intervenes, where they have weak intellectual property, uh, where uh, uh, essentially much of the Keynesian game is being played uh, by the Chinese. The Chinese are playing an interesting globalized Keynesian game. They have their industrial economy, they have their citizens to employ, and what they're doing is they're then priming their consumers, who happen to live in the United States mostly, uh, to buy their industrial product. So it's a kind of globalized Keynesian order with the Chinese um, extremely shrewd and hard-headed uh, Chinese uh, uh, um, uh, uh, political economists uh, organizing the context for their own economic growth and growth and growth. Um, next slide, please. The origins of the credit crunch. Well, firstly, growing inequality. All the trends I've discussed with it so far, pro-rich economic policies, cheap money for bankers driving from the 1980s, 
asset price inflation, private debt instead of higher wages. Um, this has led to financialization, uh, all sorts of social savings, pensions, uh, insurance of various kinds being pulled into the capital markets with the US debt economy driving global, pulling global savings to the United States. Uh, this is a trend going to the 80s and 90s, uh, and what we have at the end of the 1990s with our dear uh, uh, liberal friends, um, Clinton uh, uh, and uh, 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 Blair and Brown, um, is that we have the removal of constraints, which have been in place since the 1930s, on uh, how the financial markets work. And two bit important bits of legislation, Graham Leach, Blyley, and the Commodity Futures Modernization Act, create two monsters. They create monster one, they create the legal context, context anyway, uh, for these two monsters, um, which I'll talk about in a moment, the CBO and the CDS. And Gordon Brown collaborates in this. London becomes the economic uh, place in the first world with the lightest touch uh, at business regulation. Um, London played a key part in companies like AIG uh, and uh, operating because of their light regulation of insurance and other markets. In any event, what we ended up with is this. The underpaid American workers, lots and lots of them, uh, are being subsidized in their consumption by predatory lenders who say, oh, let's just lend them some money. These two terms were familiar among bankers and became a kind of private joke um, sent around in emails. Ninja, no, no income, no job, no assets. Um, uh, IBG, you, YBG, I'll be gone, you'll be gone. <laughs> Basically, I lend the money, my company goes well, uh, and I'll move on to another corporation. You know, leave, leave, the, leave the suckers to handle that risk. Now, how do they deal with all the bad debts which they, took, which they, 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 they created? Bad debts created, as I said, essentially to solve the problem of what would happen to that society if the real impact of falling wages was felt. Well, CBOs were this way of packaging debt, where you take a high quality interest stream, like a mortgage for a rich person, or a loan to a government, or a loan to a solvent company, and put it in a package together with a loan from some insolvent entity that couldn't, probably couldn't pay their debt. So you do that, you package it, and you sell it on. So you've got this kind of, you know, this kind of thing dragging it down, you've got this thing dragging it up. Nobody knows what it's really worth, um, because nobody knows just how bad the bad debt is. But you price it, you send it on, uh, and then some, it reaches the market, and then somebody says, oh, well, we, I'm gonna buy this, but I, I don't know what it's worth, so I'm gonna insure it. So that, that's where this comes in, the credit default swap, where uh, this particular risk of unknown value, this guy over here says, oh, I'll insure that. Uh, you pay me this premium, and I'll sell, you, uh, I'll sell you risk for this. And then this other insurance company, sometimes even connected to that insurance company here, say, I'll buy the risk from you. Uh, and so you get this proliferation on the basis of an unreal asset of fictional assets, uh, trillions and trillions of dollars of derivatives. I think before the credit crunch, there was something like $50 trillion of derivatives in circulation. They've been unwound now, and it's now about maybe 12 or 13. But uh, so th you can have a sense of just the amount of fictional wealth which was floating on top of this real economic activity. Uh, next slide, please. Um, making us pay for their crisis. Um, that's essentially what has happened. I think I should stop here to give time for questions and not to interrupt the next session. Um, but Lehman Brothers were, was allowed to fail, but what you had in the United States was US economic policy being uh, essentially directed by alumni of Goldman Sachs. Alumni who weren't just people who come through the organization, but people like the US Treasury Secretary, the head of the Federal, Federal Reserve Bank of New York, who actually have billions of dollars of their own money in Goldman Sachs assets. So uh, it's very interesting, and not entirely coincidental, that um, uh, saving Goldman Sachs effectively became one of the priorities of the world economy. Um, and uh, this was manifest in the, agree by the agreement by the US government to accept the risk of a big insurance company called AIG that was heavily involved in the derivatives market uh, at 100 cents in the dollar, which essentially meant that Goldman Sachs could say, phew, we can bank those profits which AIG was insuring. So uh, this, this, this is actually happening around the world. The Irish crisis is driven essentially by the agreement of the Irish government, of course the Irish political elite in cahoots with the Irish uh, banking classes, uh, to agree to uh, cover 100 cents in the euro uh, for Irish banks' debt. Um, uh, and that, again, is, uh, is, is, is weighing, has been, you know, is, is the sin is being repeated again. Um, refusal to pursue nationalization, which was an option in a permanent way, uh, or fractional compensation of speculators, or levies on profits, 
or indeed criminal prosecution is speculated. Has anybody apart from Madoff gone to jail uh, for this? Uh, for what, what is the most uh, extraordinary theft of assets, of public assets in world history? I mean, this is not just, uh, this, is, this is a significant international crime for which it's not been prosecuted. Anyway, I want to kind of leave time for questions, but I want to kind of end really by asking you to start to think, not just about what we're fighting against in terms of the cuts, but what we're fighting for. And I want to say that, that in the very long term, that what we're fighting for uh, is literally the future of humanity. Are we going to be living in a world in which politics essentially is something controlled by rich people who in many cases are connected to big media companies, a fascinating pattern, um, in which the, the, the intellectual and cultural space is dominated by uh, Berlusconi and Murdoch uh, and their equivalents, uh, in which uh, the, the enormous wealth and abundance of a society is going to be, uh, that's being produced by the new forms of industry and technology will be all taken uh, into the hands of the wealthy and used as a means not of increasing the abundance, but in fact of wresting more and more power and privilege from, uh, from everyone else? Or will we live in a different, a different kind of world? I just want to end with one quick note that, that when utopian socialists looked at the 19th, late 19th century world, and they looked at the increasing efficiencies and capacities of industrial production, what they said is that the great challenge of the future will be to cope with leisure, to cope essentially with an organization of a different kind of society. Now that we were freed from the necessity to work in the field, or to work uh, standing behind a handloom, or to forge, how would we organize society in different ways? Uh, organize society to achieve to, uh, the kinds of uh, uh, human, uh, uh, personal, and cultural ends uh, which represent our highest human capacity. And that defending education is a business of de de defending uh, the capacity of the human spirit to become what it could possibly be. Uh, and we are not at the end of history. Uh, and we are not weak. Uh, and we will win if we fight long and hard enough. Thank you. capacities in terms of science and technology. Uh, and what it was able to do after Mao's death was essentially to le leverage these, these, these strengths, and particularly to use the army. The Chinese army was critical to China's economic takeoff. And a lot, of, a lot of industrial activity began with the army. So they begin to produce more and more efficiency. They're already having 6 or 7% economic growth in the 1980s. Uh, this continues. This becomes like 8, 9, 10% by the time we come to the 1990s. This, they, of course, are assisted by the fact that uh, at the end of the, the Cold War, there's a lot of cheap raw materials which floods the world. Commodity prices are suppressed in the 1990s. That's, a, that's another story. Um, uh, and uh, and they, they, um, their economy grows and grows and grows. But how do they keep growing? They keep growing because they need to export. They need an export market. And they fitted neatly into this new economic model which was created in the United States in the 1970s and 80s. And what they agreed to do they watched and saw what Japan was doing. Japan did this first. Japan in the early 80s was keeping its export economy strong by buying large numbers of United States Treasury bonds. Japan was the biggest buyer of American public debt. American public debt, which ultimately allowed American consumers to buy Japanese goods. That was the model pioneered by Japan. And what the Chinese did to say, uh-huh, that's something that works, we'll do that too. And what they've done, they've done that now times 10. Uh, and China now just goes out there, and it, it's tied its dollar to the US dollar, which the Japanese, of course, couldn't do. Um, and it just buy, 